Okay. All right. It's recording. Part two of Pi Game. Really simple stuff. So this, sorry. I'm I'm trying to get in a mode here. I'm trying to be more interesting. And uh, so here's where we're at. Pi Game. The documentation. Pi Game docs dot org slash tut slash Pi Game intro. If you go to Pi Game Home. You can get to it by clicking on about and then right here it says introduction to Python for Python programmers and here we are and at the end of my last video I basically pasted this in and got a few errors while doing so and finally got it running and now I want to dive a little deeper into what is going on in this code so I'm going to copy and paste it fresh right here and save it and uh, so what it's doing here is it's you know a little bit of core Python fundamentals of course but it's importing this sys thing which I think it uses in the background to open this gif file I'm imagining and it's pronounced gif in case anybody's wondering because it's spelled gif it's not spelled gif but anyway um just kidding i don't care if you're a dork like me pronounce it some other way so and then it's importing pygame and it's importing every single module in pygame right so and then this initializes the modules which just runs their little startup code whatever they might need to do you know just like in this little module it's setting these variables stuff like that it's setting this mode size it's basically doing all, the equivalent of this stuff inside of like this module for instance so that's what that's doing and then this is setting some variables for us to use within this module right here um really all of these speeds pretty essential but like size isn't a huge deal because if i highlight that and hit Control f3 in idle then you can see there's only one instance of size used and it's never changed so really, we could just take this 320 by 240 and uh, Control C to copy it and Control V to paste it there if we wanted to. So, and then the same thing with black. That's if I hit Control F3 to search for that word, we can see it's only used in one spot and it's never changed. So. If we wanted to, we could substitute the word black there. But the cool thing is, is this is where you get that. Uh, there's always a trade-off, and it's between time, space, and readability is what it boils down to. So I should say time and space, or one or the other of those, and readability, or one or both of these, maybe, and readability. So Right here, it's a readability thing for space because you're using just a tiny little, like most people in this, you know, in the last decade or two would consider that like a, almost a moot point of just like, oh, you're going to have like one little tuple that, and you could say tuple, of course, it comes from the word like quadruple or quadruple, however you might say words like that. It's that UPL at the end of those kinds of words. So tuple, tuple, whatever, tomato, tomato kind of thing. But anyway, this is so this is kind of like the closest thing I would say to an array that Python has, maybe. I mean, you could argue that the list is. But this is basically like an immutable list. Um, and immutable means you can't change the values in place. You'd have if you change like if I were to change black then it would give me a new copy if I passed it a tuple. It wouldn't like replace the values in the tuple. But in a list, it would replace the values. If Anyway, I don't want to get too much into that right now. Um, but one thing here that this is really old code, by the way. This is like early 2000s code. So if we run it with F5, save it, OK. Then we can see it's a little tiny box, and it's going really fast. And it's funny because it changes when I move this 
And if I do something that takes a lot of processing power, like launching the task manager, it slows to a crawl for a second. But uh, what it's doing is it's basically trying to use every bit of CPU power it can. It's not throttled in any way, shape, or form. So when anything comes in and interferes with it getting 100% CPU time, you can see it slowing down. Which this is a quad core system, and in theory, it should have had enough core power to do that. But it shows that there are bottlenecks that um, even multiple cores can't always escape. So then I can click the X, and it's just going to freeze it and stop the code and give me back my prompt back here. So that's normal if that happens to you. And I want to say in older versions of Python, that didn't happen. I know with the GUI graphical stuff, like the more modern versions, I think, tend to leave the window open for you. But anyway, I'm going to close this little run window. And sorry if my voice gets louder and quieter and stuff. That's the Windows sound system thing. And because that, because we initialized every single module, one of the things that initialized was, excuse me, was the audio. So it, even though I have all the ducking disabled and everything, there's still a certain amount of ducking that goes on. So whatever, I've fiddled with every setting I can and I can't seem to get that to go away short of just doing stuff that does zero, doesn't touch the audio whatsoever. Okay, so continuing to go through line by line here. We've covered this. These are some values. You know, this obviously sets the screen size at some point or some kind of width and height at some point. And what's going on here is this is a tuple. So really, it could be put into parentheses like this. And that's what I would do just to make it more clear personally. But honestly, I've been staring at this code so much, I'm starting to get used to just this little piece of code that I'm starting to get used to seeing tuples without parentheses around them now too. But anyway, that's what it is. It's just like a little list that is immutable, like I said, and then it's coming over here and it's unpacking it. It's like destructuring it into these two individual variables, which if you're familiar with core Python, you know that already. And it's kind of tricky though on this one line of what's going on here because that happens, right? And then this effectively disappears and then it evaluates this. And so now these are effectively, that has 320 behind it and this has 240 behind it. But this is evaluated as a tuple now. So this is evaluated a lot like this at that point. And then that together gets passed into size. So that's the effect that's going on there. And then speed is, if we highlight that one, control F3, we can see it's used several times and it is mutated. So it's changed right here. It's effectively flipping the speed and that's the ball hitting the edge of the screen and then what it's doing is it's flipping that so-called speed so it's making this a negative two instead of a positive two basically and it's doing the same thing for the vertical as well and then if we come and so what i want to do while i'm right here is actually change these since if we look at them like i said they're only used in two places and they're not mutated so they're like if you are a, in my opinion, bad JavaScript programmer, I'm the worst JavaScript programmer, so I feel like I could say this, but if you're a bad JavaScript programmer, you'll use the word const a lot. And I know that that seems like the right thing to do. I've been there, but it's not. But anyway, if you're going to make something a const, or at least want it to be constant, you should write it in capital letters. So that's just one of those standard practices across many languages to do and all of these are only used once and the value isn't mutated so to call it a, you know if you're only setting that value one time like that you might as well call it a const or to or make it appear as such so that's what i'm going to do and the same thing with black here so then what i'll need to do is highlight these i don't know if it will find it in lowercase yeah it will cool so i can do it like that and then do size. I'm hitting control F3 once I double click it. Size. Just to make it a little more readable, you know, or and self-explanatory, I think. So 
that's something in a larger program if you were to see those values get changed down in the meat of the code you think like hey wait a minute that looks like a const it's all capital so I really shouldn't be doing that or else if I really need to maybe I should lowercase the letters speed of course like I said I left that lowercase because it does get mutated and that's why it's using a list instead of a tuple and I'm almost positive a list is less efficient than a tuple it depends on what you're doing with the list though obviously right here it's going to be more efficient in the context it's used because it's mutating the values so if it were to mutate those values with and it being a tuple it would make a copy of the tuple and have to do that and there would either be you know there'd be a lot of garbage collection going on theoretically there especially with how fast that ball was moving that would just pile up a lot of variables of memory so this is in place changing them it's effectively going into that those bytes of memory and just flipping their values instead of reserving new space okay and then screen let's see how much if I do the control F3 on there there's a couple of screens and arguably it does change on these the value of screen is changing it's an object so I'm going to go ahead and leave it lowercase because objects in especially dynamic languages like this should never be const so there's something to think about let's check out ball here a lot of balls okay so this i think was the only ball by itself right here um I'm just going to say, I'm not sure if this is an object, probably is, but I'm just going to go ahead and make it uppercase too. That one's sort of an on the fencer. I wouldn't blame me if you didn't. It's probably better if you don't because it probably, it actually, you know what? I'm going to put that back. Because it is, ah, <laughs> it is a, an object, it's a surface. So when we come down here, these two things are surfaces, basically. And what a surface is, is just think of it like a little transparency layer or something like that, maybe like a little sheet of glass or something. It's just, it's something you're going to write to. Or it's basically pixel data is what I should say. So this one represents the entire screen, and it's going to reserve that little 320 by 240 window. And that's that for the most part. That's sort of like boilerplate for what you'd want to do with any graphical thing. And then right here, this one is going to load in this image right here. So if you don't have that image, right click, save image as into the same folder that you've saved this code as. And it should save with that name. If you save it with another name, make sure they line up. So that's going to create the ball surface. And then this rectangle is going to get the rectangular coordinates around that and we can open up I have so right here on the thing it has that and if you click that it will you can open another window and get the rectangle stuff of all the values and deals to do with the rectangle object here's all the methods so it's a Python object for storing rectangular coordinates. Top left width height. That's obviously a constructor. These are optional uh, type indicator hints. All right, so I'm gonna, and here's the one for surface too. And you can find those, there's surface, there's rectangle. Let's go back to this code here. And then it comes in here and it does a while loop. And I'm going to change this. It's old school Python. I'm going to kind of update it to more of a Python 3 style thing and change that to true, an infinite while loop. And then right here is effectively the event loop where it's going to go through and check if there's anything, you know, has anything, any sort of interaction type of stuff happen, stuff like that. And right here it's checking to see if somebody clicks the X and on that window, basically. And if it does, it's going to do, oh, I guess that's where they're using sys on sys exit right there and then it comes down here to the ball rectangle equals ball rectangle dot move speed so if you really want to know what move is you go over to that rect and then uh 
Click on that and come down here. Moves the rectangle. Returns a new rectangle that is moved by the given offset. The X and Y arguments can be any integer value, positive or negative. Okay. And then if ball rectangle left, so this would be the left side of that rectangle. Should have stayed on that page, huh? The left side of the rectangle. Let's see, and go back up here. All right, Control F left. My game uses that stuff. What was I missing? All wrecked is get wrecked. Top, bottom, so those are properties, they're not methods. Which properties are usually quicker to access, but they're not as pure object-oriented style, of course. You, In a more strictly object-oriented system, you'd want everything to be a method. But really, that makes sense to just leave them as plain old pop properties because they are in the way that they're accessed especially you go lean towards speed okay the virtual attributes which can be used to move and align the rectangle right here so that's where it starts describing those things And that makes me think maybe they are methods. I'm, I can't remember what a virtual attribute is in Python. So go to Python docs. That really sounds like a, a method. Search maybe an in index virtual attributes. Doesn't have it there. It's Python. Virtual attributes. Way too many results. Okay, well for now, I'm not even gonna bother digging through that. Whatever, right here, let me check in here. Virtual, true, nope. And even if they're not, it must have something within itself, some type of a, an event loop type of effect that would check those attributes even if they're not really methods themselves and then it so we get down into here this is that was just the uh, checking for the exit and right here is the thing we were just talking about obviously and what it's doing is it's uh, checking if that left side of that rectangle is less than zero then it's going off the edge of the screen box whatever screen box was defined and if it's greater than the width pretty self-explanatory right and then the same thing with the height, whether or not the uh, it's less than zero, which this is the origin in most computer graphics stuff is this upper left corner. So that would be zero, zero. So if it's less than zero, it would be trying to go off the top of the window and greater than height would be trying to go off the bottom of the window. And if so, in either of those cases, if it's trying to go one pixel past the edge, then it will effectively negate and flip that value so whenever just like in regular math whenever you see like a negative sign right there that's the same thing as negative one times so it just so if this is positive one positive one times negative one is going to make it negative one and negative one times negative one two negatives equals a positive and a opposites equals a negative right so if we run that we can see it still works and then so it it does that every time through and then it comes through after it detects whether or not the ball's one pixel off or not which i believe is before it draws it one pixel off it goes ahead and fills that little window black solid black and then it 
redraws the ball. That's what blitting is, is blitting is like drawing that little sprite again. And it redraws it with these new coordinates. So if it was going one screen, one pixel off, it will now go one pixel that way, and then it will draw it that way. And what you're really doing with this, uh, this little screen surface is doing is it makes it so that that screen right here, this screen blit thing is always going to point at it's a double buffering effect so it's always going to point you have two surfaces effectively behind the scenes and it's going to point at the one that's not being displayed when you write to it and then after you write to it you'll immediately call flip and that will change which one of those surfaces the screen's looking at the the visible screens pointing to so it will you won't be trying to race the beam so to speak as far as like you know getting screen tears or partial image draws and stuff like that it's just what it's a simple effect that anybody familiar with like video game programming knows about that that makes the images appear smoothly and animate a lot more smoothly so that's that in a nutshell i hope i didn't like over explain or stutter too much on that so it's just you know the imports and initializations set a few variables like i said these in this is good practice the way this is going on here for anything that's going to scale beyond the most simple example but we really could just like cut those and uh anywhere we see size we could paste them and anywhere we saw width we could write 320 and height 240 and then it would still well I don't, yeah that should work So what line is that saying? On line four. I better comment that out. And the same thing with black, I'll comment that out and just grab those. Better grab the whole thing. Come down here. And it needs those double parentheses inside the function or else it will evaluate as a normal function being past three integers in there. Oh. Argument one on line eight. It's right here. Oh, which I did wrong right here. So that's why it was complaining at me. Of course, it's working. So let me put all those back real quick. It's back how we were. I'll run it real quick, test it, make sure it still works. Still working. Close that out. And now what I want to do real quick before I'm done with this video is um, kind of make it a little bit more real world terms and a little bit more modern. So we'll bump it up to 640 by 480, effectively doubling these coordinates. You can go even bigger if you want. And that will give us a bigger screen, a bigger display. And then one more thing we can do um, that speed on mine because I'm recording the video as well that's actually <laughs> the more reasonable speed but I bet on your computer it's going a lot faster so you can change the speed down to one so instead of moving two coordinates at a time it will only move one and then hit F5 and then you get a little bit slower and smoother type of a ball bounce you can actually focus on the ball a little bit more of course like I said yours should be going slightly faster than that if we move the window, it pauses that and close this little run window. So that's some stuff you can do to kind of kick this around a little bit. Make sure you have an understanding of all this code of what's going on. Very last time through, we got the regular old imports of the stuff we'll need. If you want to find those, you can just highlight them, control F3, and you can see where they're used. Pygame. And, uh, setting some values to be used later 
which is a good idea at the top of a module to set them like this so that they're readable within here so we know okay we're not just if we were to just use this like we did where I pasted that in here then that becomes what's called a magic number because it's just this number you know you could argue that like even these zeros or ones right here are well they didn't really use that one right they did it like this so but and these ones are index values which are still kind of magic numbers because it's like what is speed zero what is speed one right but what we could do up here is say we know that speed zero is the uh, left and right speed right so we could say horizontal I think that's how I spell it equals zero and vertical equals one and then come in here and speed could still look like that for now right and then we could come down here where we have speed zero and say horizontal horizontal Your vertical so this is getting rid of that magic number effect because now we know this is the horizontal speed is being negated or the vertical speed is being negated or we could even make this be like it's obvious it's a speed right I mean I think right here it's nice to see this called speed because then you intuitively know okay if I lower that number it's probably gonna go slower and if I raise it it's probably gonna go faster so right there, that's a good name for it. But down here where we're actually using it the most, it's more of like a direction. So if we say direction, then uh, change all these to direction. I should actually do that. And Oops. Let me do I use uh, control F and then I'm going to type speed, make sure I got them all. It doesn't look like it's finding anything. Okay. And this should all still work the same. The direction thing's optional. That's one of those on the fence things. Invalid syntax. Lost a bracket there. Okay, still working. Or anything else so now it's a little wordy so speed was kind of like okay I don't know directions whatever technically this is a block statement so it should really have a space there and if you really wanted to you could probably even put a space there make it a little more readable and then once you start getting to where it's like oh wow I'm having to scroll to see what's going on then that tells you especially if you have a reasonable size screen you know with just like 20 or 30 lines by you know maybe 80 wide or something that's about the limit and that's that becomes a code smell to where you should be asking yourself maybe i should push this stuff out into modules of its own and then i can just say check ball direction you know whatever you'd highlight this and comment above the top of it with right here like check ball direction or uh what is it here check and move ball maybe whatever comment you pit right there that's what you would you could just at first name a function and push it down or above in Python I guess out of the way and uh, yeah and right here you could say like you know handle message loop or event loop or whatever right there or a function and then you could begin pushing func functions off the screen and you'd end up with a more declarative type of a thing where it just declares each function speaks for itself in its name of what you're doing and uh, then if you end up with too many functions then you can push those out to modules and that's a way to begin scaling a program so thanks for checking all this out and
maybe it'll help you a little bit. Get feel a little more comfortable with that code going line by line. Did I make everything completely obvious here? This right here, this display set mode, you know, Python's just, or Pygame, excuse me, that's the the Pygame module. You know, this is the display module within, or I should say that's the Pygame package. This is the display module within there. And then this is effectively a method because um, like even this, this whole file right here is effectively a singleton object in Python. So you can treat it just like a singleton object. And that's one of the beauties of Python. You don't have to go in and put all that class and init crap in there. You can just do this and have that. So that's a pattern that I usually try and stick to. I try not to write out any class. I try and avoid the class keyword as much as possible with Python and always with Java script, excuse me, um, two dynamic scripting languages that both support like a, a module style pattern. JavaScript more with Node.js and the traditional common JS modules uh, to a certain degree, even in the browser when you include files together and stuff. But not, I shouldn't even get into the JavaScript talk. There's a lot of exceptions to that, but um, yeah, so that's what that's doing, you know, and really we could say like import, we could do import sys on its own line and then come down here and import or say from Pygame. The other style of import from Pygame, import display, and what else are we using? Ball and or no, we're, balls are variable. We're doing display image. I think there's one more, right? So do. Uh, I like Pygame and just control F3 through it. So init is on Pygame itself. Display, image, event. The so display image and event. Um, some people might frown upon this style of deal. I like a space below the imports too right there. Some people might frown on this and be like, Hey, that's uh, sorry, it's hard for me to think and do two things. Um, now you don't want to do that. You might pollute your namespace. And yeah, but if you are polluting your namespace by doing this, then that tells you you really should push what you're doing out to a more singular module, like a more isolated module, because which just means a new pi file that you import, right? But that's. It, you know, a module should do, for the most part, one thing and one thing well. So if you're polluting that namespace, you're trying to do too many things, really. Oops. That one. Well, yeah, I think. Sorry, I'm rusty on Python right now, obviously. So I think maybe we can just do it like that. And when you import it, it will import all of the names. It should import all of the names that aren't prefixed with an underscore. So if you do your own module and you want something to be effectively private, then you just precede the name with an underscore, and then it won't be exported and visible to regular module imports. Okay, let's see how many errors that gives us. It says name, Pygame, not defined, which I figured that much. So that's an interesting one there where it's like that. So I guess I could do pi game as well. Um, not import name pi game from pi game. So maybe this is a. Uh, Uh, shortcoming in the design of how Pi Game, so I'll do the import Pi Game. This almost defeats the purpose of the line above. Actually, to just kind of make that a little more, this almost defeats the purpose of even doing this because one of the reasons you would do this is a little bit more efficiency. If you're only 
using one or a few modules, stuff like that from a package, then it's usually better to do this because it's going to be more efficient. You're just going to import those few little things you're using. If you're using about this much or more, then it's usually considered a best practice to just go ahead and import the whole module. But honestly, Pygame has so much in it that I would say you could really do this probably to your heart's content and get a little bit better efficiency. Because for one thing, the audio, like we don't even need the audio. But right here to get this Pygame name, because they've named, they have stuff. This is not only a package, but it's a module itself apparently because it has methods within it. So we can't sort of use that technique. We have to import it in isolation, which effectively brings all this in. But by doing this still, we're able to shorten the names down here if we don't want to have to prefix them all with Pygame. So let's see how this runs. It doesn't, it tries to. So why didn't it run? Construction horizontal. Hmm. That's interesting. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what I did to make that not work there. Be something in the direction, I'm assuming. A rectangle move. Maybe some way that the Python, uh, excuse me, Pygame works under the hood, that it does have to be like that. Pygame. Like we might be missing some constants or whatever that it that these are expecting just because of the way that it's designed. But one thing, whenever you see a double dot, that's sort of a code smell and design if that's required. Um, if we could just import these separately and not have to have them prefixed with Pygame or prefix them with Pygame, then that double dot would be okay because we're just choosing the long naming scheme. But in this situation where it looks like it's required, that's not cool. So I think event is one. What else am I missing here? Displays one. Let's let it yell for what we're missing still. This one straight out, no error. Or is there? Name event is not defined on 19. But my line number's turned on, so I'm looking at them down here. In event, that would be Pygame event. Up here, quit. Here we have a game of tribute type. Maybe there was an error on that first thing when it froze and I didn't notice it, but by game type. What is it again? Uh, line 20. Me too. A game event type. Uh oh. There's no attribute type. Well, I've done something really bad now. I don't understand how port pi game. That should work fine. Pi game init. Pi game display. File is saved. Pi game event dot get. Let's go look at the original code. 
here. Oh, if event dot type. Weird. Oh, for event. That's kind of a little bit of a confusing thing right there because we have Pygame event. That must have been why we were having a conflict when I did get rid of Pygame. That makes sense. It was freezing up right at this event thing. All right, fine. I'm going to go through and get rid of Pygame. All right, and I'm going to bring this back in and I'm going to change this so that it's just called E. Because what was happening there is this was conflicting with this, I believe, the naming. Yeah, so now it works like that. So that's kind of some of the pros and cons of why you might want to use this scheme or not to get those shorter names. And then if you do, of course, make sure that you don't reuse names out of that package, especially if the package isn't prefixed, which was the original way they had it was the prefixed method. So anyway, thanks for watching.